Crown Produce secures produce locally and from around the world for Canadian retailers. Crown Produce is also proud to secure sponsorship of University Football on Shaw. Crown Produce, supporting Canadian retailers and Canadian amateur football. Whether it's your first home, a refinance, or an investment property, Kia Grant & Associates can find a mortgage solution for you. In association with Barrico Paragon, the work she does for you is free. Find her on Facebook at Kia Grant Mortgages. Legendary punk band DOA have a brand new studio album out now. We come in peace. There's also a brand new live album by DOA. Welcome to Chinatown DOA Live. Get them at SuddenDeath.com. Part of the sound of Crown Countdown U is provided by The Real Mackenzies. The new album, West Winds, featuring My Luck Is So Bad, is available on iTunes. Canada West season opens with a record breaker in Manitoba. It's the Purple Surprise in Lennoxville. And Queens and Max set the tone in Ontario. Crown Countdown U starts now. Hey everybody, welcome to Crown Countdown U and welcome to beautiful UBC Thunderbird Stadium. The rent check didn't clear. We'll be back in studio again next week. Hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. If it doesn't bounce. Not guaranteed. Probably will. Yeah, the Bank of Mullen, we'll see if it works. Uh, it was a week one jam-packed with upsets. Not really jam-packed, there's one upset, really. It was a, maybe a marmalade more than a jam, but it was jelly filled with close calls, including one that happened about 10 feet out those doors. That's right, Ryan. We're going to begin in the Canada West, where there was a barn burner here on the campus at UBC. However, I want to start in Saskatoon, where the Jim Mullen created wheat belt was on the line. No better atmosphere in the Canada West than Saskatchewan, especially when it's a clash between these cross provincial rivals. Griffiths was rocking as it was support the troops night in Saski. The Huskies sporting those slick camo uniforms in front of a crowd of just under 6,000. The game kicked off with a moment of silence and a nine gun salute for those service men and women who have served for Canada. All right, early in the first queue, Huskies running back Dexter Jenke finds a hole and he goes for a little run, busting through the Rams line and into the house for a 31-yard major. Yeah, Rams top recruit Calvin Smith was injured on the play. He was seen sporting an air cast on his foot on the sideline, and he did not return. Midway through the first, though, down by 15. New Regina pivot came and Shutter goes deep for Addison Richards, who makes an outstanding grab. Shutter placing it perfectly for the big receiver. That would put the Rams inside the five. Mikey Apway would cap the drive with his five-yard major. That cut the deficit down to eight. Shutter would have trouble all day long with the pass rush here. Dane Bishop gets to him. One of eight sacks the Huskies would pressure on the day. That pressure would sustain, too. Very next play, Shutter in his end zone makes a massive mistake. He tries to air it out, but uh, Sean Kemp's illegitimate son, Dylan Kemp, with the INT, his first as a Husky. That leads to this 11-yard grab from Mitch Stevens, who, by the way, has one of the best flows in the CIS. Take a look at those locks. Sasky goes up by 15. Former QB and uh, turned coach Mark Mueller wondering just what's going on there on the Rams' sideline, and Mueller's pain would only get worse as right before the half, Drew Burko finds Mr. Vidal Sassoon once again. Stevens hauls in his second major of the day. More bad news for the Rams. Take a look at the right of your screen. Number 65 in white, big boy Aaron Pickton's leg gets folded up underneath Shutter. He needed to be helped off the field and he did not return. We need a couple more boys to carry him. Second half now and the Rams find some life. Burko's pass gets plucked by Connor Ketchin. Takes it 59 yards inside the Sasky five. That leads to this goal line squirm from Landon Bush, who just ekes it out over the white line. Regina starts to gain some momentum. 
fourth cue and after being quiet for half a game, the bad man comes out to play. Milton Solomon and he has got it on the run. The first time tonight, the bad, bad man, Colton Solomon into the end zone. Touchdown, Regina Rams. Colton Solomon goes 98 yards to the house. They would add a two point convert. Suddenly the Rams are down by just eight, unreal. A couple minutes later and more disaster for the Huskies, Travoy Martinez. I don't know what he's doing here. He has a brain freeze on this punt return, touches the ball in the end zone with Justin Edrelin from the Rams, leaps on the biscuit. Regina gets the major and they convert the two pointer. Now all locked up at 33. The Rams are racing a 26 point deficit. But it would all come crumbling down as late in the queue, Burko finds guess who? Stevens with his third major of the day, and that would stand up as the winner. The Huskies avoid a catastrophic collapse, hanging on to claim the Wheat Belt with a seven-point win. Yeah, look at those helmets, love them. Paul Mitchell Stevens with a monster game, scoring three touchdowns, including the game winner, leading all Huskies receivers with 83 yards on the night. Drew Burko with a solid performance, tossing for three touchdowns, for 267 yards on 23 of 35 passing, and of course the one INT. Despite a slow start, to his first CIS game, Cayman Shutter had a brilliant second half, finishing the game, connecting on 50% of his passes for 319 yards and one touchdown. Calgary, UBC. It was a lovely day at Point Grey. UBC hosting the winners of the last five Hardy Cups in a row. Mercer Timmis taking the handoff nice and early. He drives in the rock from three yards out. Dinos lead seven zap. A few minutes later, new T-Birds QB Carson Williams Looks to the air for Josh Kronstrom. Kronstrom looking like a young Jim Edmonds. Less the mitts and a different sport. That sets up this plunge from Greg Bocott. Knotting the game up at seven apiece. It spiked that ball. That'll boy. Third cue now. And on the opening kickoff, Alex Morrison fields the pigskin from inside his own 10. He decides he likes the view from Grouse Mountain. He's going to the gondola. He takes it 102 yards all the way to the house. UBC now in the lead, 14-10, but that lead would evaporate quickly. Eric Zaleski goes off balance, airs out an absolute gem to Brett Blasco. It's 17-14 CGY. Mercer Timmis then gets back in on the act. He takes it in from a yard out, and Calgary increases the gap. They go up 10. The relentless T-Birds, though, not going down without a fight. Less than a minute into the fourth, Brandon Deschamps busts his way up the gut. Cut the cord, that baby's free. 59 yards later, UBC right back in the thick of things. UBC once again would knot things up at 24 after a field goal. And with Calgary having to punt, David Scott can't field the biscuit. The Dinos pounce on the ball, which leads to this goal line score from backup QB Andrew Buckley, who came in to replace starter Eric Dulesky. More news on that in just a moment. Dinos back up seven. But once again, the T-Birds refuse to lose. Bocott connects with Deschamps, who refuses to go down. He rumbles into the pay dirt for his second major of the day. We are tied again at 31. Calgary would retake the lead with a Johnny Mark 42-yard field goal, and then Buckley gives Timmis the shovel pass, who takes the ball inside the T-Birds five-yard line, where he gets the call once again to cap off the drive. It is his third touchdown of the day. Calgary gets a scare, but they manage to escape with a 10-point win. Timmis led the attack for the Dinos, rushing for 115 yards on 15 takes, while also picking up 41 yards on three receptions, scoring, as mentioned earlier, three majors. Buckley replaced Dulesky late in the third, connecting on six of 11 passes while rushing for one TD. The word on Eric Dulesky, not good. It is a broken foot. He will miss the rest of the 2013 season. To the brand spanking new Investors Field is where we're headed to now. A Canada West record 10,199 on hand for this one early in the first queue and the herd, they start to rumble. Nick Dembski, he goes one way and decides, nah, I'm gonna take it the other way. Doubles back and puts on the afterburners, taking it 62 yards where he gets pushed out at the one. Keenan LaFrance would cap off that drive. Bisons take the early lead. However, Golden Bears would strike back. Ryan Schwartz with the screen pass. Andre Webster who then uses the B button move 
from Madden, spins his way out of the tackle and takes it to the house. That's a 39-yard major. Alberta down just four now. The herd would add another seven, but Schwartz would keep the G-Bears in as he scampers his way into the end zone, bringing the Manitoba lead down to just four. But this pick six from Tyler Fong takes the wind out of Alberta's sails as he takes it back to the house. A 75-yard return. Alberta gives it their all, but they get trampled by the herd. The win for the Bisons was the first for a home team at Investors as their stadium sharing brethren. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers have yet to win in their new digs. Early season Heck Crichton Award contender Anthony Coombs torched the G-Bears, scoring two touchdowns on the ground and one in the air for a combined 260 all-purpose yards. Alberta QB Ryan Schwartz did his part for the G-Bears, connecting on 32 of 46 passes for 352 yards and four touchdowns. The SFU transfer also rushed for 150 yards and one touchdown. After the game, Bison's head coach Brian Doby said this one is one the players won't soon be forgetting. You know, remember this night. Someday you'll be telling your grandchildren about it. You'll bring them back into this facility to show them the locker you were in. Uh, this is uh, this is an emotional, emotional night and an emotional win for us. And uh, whew, away we go. Quick glance at the standings now in the C Dub, and as expected, all the top dogs are sitting undefeated. Let's head over now to the OUA and the land that one man and one team built. Kyle Quinlan and the McMaster Marauders. Well, Quinlan the medicine man is gone and the Marauders were in tough in week one. All right, Mac putting their 19 game interconference win streak on the line. The temporary and slightly refurbished Richardson Stadium absolutely rocking on Labor Day. Start things out with the Goodyear blimp cam. Dylan Walmsley drilling from 33 yards out. Queens takes the early lead for blank. It would be short-lived though, just over a minute later, Danny Van Der Voort takes the deep lob from Marshall Ferguson, see ya, 73 yards all the way to the house, Mac scratches the scoreboard and we got ourselves a game. Shortly after though, another back and forth, this time it's Jesse Andrews going for a scamper, 28 yards but was recently diagnosed with the Bart Simpson butterfinger, luckily Zach Ishmael is Johnny on the spot, the Zebras talk it out. That's a no-brainer. Queens leads 11-7 at the half. Third cue. Ferguson sets back and completes the pass, but it's laid out on a tee for Jan Dika token He takes it and... But get that fat head out of the way. I immediately regret saying that. Your head is not fat. The man they call Jan Dika Balatoken, or Jan Dika Balatoken for short, goes 99 yards to the house. Fourth cue. Ferguson sets back and again, Jan Dika Balatoken shocks the Marauders with another take back. This time, 70 yards all the way to pay dirt. He majors in kinesiology and minors in amazing last names. Dika Balatoken makes it 31 to 10 Queens. Ferguson would regain a bit of swagger. He hits Michael DeCroce from five out for the major, then Joshua Van de Vert from 13. His swagger would be short-lived, however. He gets picked again. This time it's Matt Webster with the defensive hands, looking like a young Jan Dika Balatoken. Your final score, 31-24, Queens effectively snapping that 19 straight game interconference win streak that used to belong to the McMaster Marauders. Your key guys on the Mac side of things, despite the three picks, Marshall Ferguson threw the ball 60 times, completing 39 for 459 yards along with three majors. For Queens, I don't want to say his name again. You know who I'm talking about though. YDB with two picks for 169 interception yards and two touchdowns. Yandika Balatoken. Over to Alumni Stadium where there was an upset of Bruin. Second half action, Guelph down by one when Lancers QB Austin Kennedy throws a pick on his own one yard line. Taylor Palmer with the pick six there. However, the Lancers would retake the lead. Guelph down two now in the final minute. Jazz Lindsay hurls it downfield for his brother Saxon who makes the outstanding catch putting the Griffins deep in the Lancers zone. That sets up this game-winning field goal from Dan Ferrero. Wealth escapes with the win and improved to 2-0. and oh. The Lindsay brothers both with big days on the afternoon. Austin Kennedy with a massive day despite the loss. The Varsity Blues take their flag on the road to Laurier. So the Jayhawks pull their flag out and we've got ourselves an old-fashioned flag off. 
Toronto uses its special teams to set the tone early as Jaden McBride blocks the Ronnie Pfeffer field goal attempt with his butt kiss. That leads to this connection between second year pivot Chris Jugovic and rookie Levi Noel, who takes it down inside the Jayhawks' five, which sets up this six yard major to Paul to pass. The Blues take a 7 0 lead. Second cue now, Jugovic tosses it to running back Aaron Milton, who uses the flea flicker to find Alex Perchelski. A 30 yard score blues up 14 3. This 32 yard field goal from Eric Hewittson puts the boys from Hogtown up 17 3 at the beer break. Move to the third, and here's a how to video on how not to tackle your opponent. Perchalski dodges four would be tacklers for his second major of the night. A couple minutes later, the Jayhawks go for it on third and eight, and the ball bounces off John Connor's back. John Connor! Kevin Keenahan, Johnny on the spot. He takes it 65 yards inside the Laurier 40. The Blues now on third and 10 fake the punt, and punter Marcus Hobbs shows he's more than just a good boot, tossing a beauty strike to Dave Green to put the Blues inside the Jayhawks' red zone, which leads to this 12-yard field goal. However, Laurier won't go down without a fight. Here, Greg Nyhoff hauls in this 35-yard catch, which cuts the Blues' lead to 17, which they then follow up just minutes later, a 38-yard score from Anthony Pizzuti. Just six minutes to go, Beth Harris boot from 45 yards is good. Jayhawks down just seven, but the Blues defense made some big stops down the stretch to seal that victory. Jugovic with a big game for the Blues, tossing 259 yards and two touchdowns. Brachowski hauls in five grabs, two of them for majors. Jayhawks pivot Julian John with a huge game, connecting on 25 of 49 for 345 yards, two touchdowns, and of course, the one pick. Waterloo at home to the GGs, looking to bounce back from a week one thrashing. But this isn't going to help the cause as Ottawa's QB Aaron Colbon caps off an 85 yard drive with his one yard plunge. GGs up by seven. And Colbon goes to the air to find Andrew Mullings for a 25 yard major. Ottawa improves to 500 to the win in the Lou. Colbon with a big day, tossing for 452 yards in those four TDs. Even rushed for 75 yards in a major. Brendan Galanders rushed for 144 yards on 22 carries in the win. There's a good shot of Western's version of Bo Jackson. More on number 11 in just a moment as we take a look at the new kids on the block. No, not Jordan and Donnie. It's the Carlton Ravens and those sharp new buckets. Back to number 11 in purple, that's George Johnson, who in the winter breaks ankles on the hard court, but here in the fall, as you can see, he is a defensive back's nightmare. He hauls in a one-handed diving snag. This led to a touchdown. Kid's got some pretty good hands. While up by 30, Will Finch hands it off to Adam Sinclair, who busts up the gut, adds to that total. The Purple Ponies ruin the Ravens' first game back on the gridiron, basting them, blasting them, and destroying them by 67. Johnson led all receivers by a country mile in yards, hauling in nine catches for 167 yards and one major. His partner in crime, Will Finch, was nothing short of fantastic connecting on 26 of 32 passes for 409 yards with three touchdowns. CIS first team all-star Garrett Sanvito had just another day at the office, rushing for 125 on the ground on 18 carries and scoring twice. Let's take a look now at the OUA standings board. Not all teams have played a pair just yet, but of course Guelph, Queens, and those Western Purple Ponies sitting atop the mountain. All right, let's take this puppy over to K back to the RSEQ now, where Laval was looking for a 60th win in a row at home. However, we're not going to start there. We're going to start get this on the campus of Bishop's University. It's not often that we start with Bishop's highlights, but this time we just got it. 2,750 in the seats at Coulter Field, and right off the bat, Gabrielle Goulet pulls one down from the stratosphere. That would lead to three on the board for the green guys. Jordan Heather then decides it's his turn to get it going. He finds Jeff Coventry for 46 yards, and we got a ball game. I'm getting a little Superman now he's at it. Exactly three minutes later, Jeremy Doyen Rock looks to the skies for Alexander Pichet, and you can put it on the board. Sherbrook takes the lead. Then just 35 seconds later, Heather rolls to his left and finds Alexander Fox. He turns on the Jets, putting it for 69, dude, to pay dirt. The Gators would still trail at the half, though, at 17-15. Final cue now with a chance to put the game away. JDR gets picked by O'Shane Daly. 
That's right, his name is O'Shane Daly. The green and yellow would get one last chance with a few ticks left on the clock. Matthew E. Bear, I'm looking for Ray Finkel and a clean pair of shorts. He shanks it from 33 yards out. The Bishop Gators pull off the upset of the century. Uh, maybe not of the century, a little bit of a stretch there, but might be for the year, partially because it's week one. And nonetheless, the final score from Lennoxville, Quebec, 28-27 for the purple and black. Both pivots toss an exceptional game. Heather tossing for close to 400 yards in the three TDs. Well, JDR wasn't too shabby himself, but those three picks really came back to hurt him. After the game, Heather had nothing but praise for his opponents. They're a good team, you know, we've been working really hard on creating our offense better, our special teams especially. We came out and we did what coaches told us to do and we happened to win the game, right? They're a great team and we just happened to beat them today. McGill, Laval. We start with Laval already leading 16 blank when 5'6 DB Vincent Platt plants QB Jonathan Collin for a loss of 10. Honorable mention to the O-line though. Shades of Dominic Hasek on Marion Gabbert. A gorgeous flip, 10s across the board. Next series for the Rouge Or and Tristan Grenon goes over the middle between four defenders connecting with Guillaume Ryu for 34. Ryu reminds the Zebras, move them sticks. That leads to a six yard score from Pascal Lachard who does it the hard way. Laval wins its 60th consecutive game at the Statel, smacking down the Redmen 32 to eight. Rouge Or have not lost to McGill in over a decade, improving to 24 and 5 over the Redmen all time. Tristan Grenon tossed for 163 yards on 12 of 28 passing. Kicker Boris Bidet led the offense for Laval, nailing all four of his field goal attempts. Louis Guimont Mota led the ground attack for McGill, rushing for a game high 128 yards in the losing effort. The number five team in the nation hit the road in search of an opening night victory. Early in the first queue, Montreal pull a little trickery on this punt return. Antoine Pernot takes the end around and then gets a massive block woo, from Wilgins de Rivio, who tosses his man like a ragdoll. Pernot goes all the way for 89 yard return. Montreal goes up nine to nada. Check out this hammer from de Rivio. Mitch Day wondered if we got the license plates of that truck that hit him. Second cue now, Rotran the man, Sene gets into action. Busts loose for a gain of 58, going deep into the Stinger's red zone, which he later caps off in the drive, putting the Caravan up 16 to zero. Later in the queue, Pernod sacks Stinger's QB, Reed Quest, who coughs up the rock, which Montreal would recover. The ball now deep in Concordia's zone, and Sene rides his line and basically walks it in for an easy 17 yard major. Montreal takes this one easily, winning by 45, but it looks like they'll be out without offensive lineman Simon Lejare, who suffered a knee injury on the play and could be out for quite some time. Sene kicks off the 2013 campaign in style, rushing for a game-high 182 yards and two touches. The Caribans defense was smothering all day long, racking up an incredible eight sacks. No surprise that Laval's sitting on top, but check out the Bishop's Gators undefeated but for how long? Coming up, the round table with 2011 Heck Creighton winner, Billy Green. Crown Produce secures produce locally and from around the world for Canadian retailers. Crown Produce is also proud to secure sponsorship of University Football on Shaw. Crown Produce, supporting Canadian retailers and Canadian amateur football. Whether it's your first home, a refinance, or an investment property, Kia Grant & Associates can find a mortgage solution for you. In association with Barrico Paragon, the work she does for you is free. Find her on Facebook at Kia Grant Mortgages. All right, it's time for the roundtable feature. Of course, we have Mr. Jim Mullen. We have Billy Green, former UBC quarterback. Uh, I feel like a little bit of a divorce lawyer here at this table, but it's not too bad. A nice little setup. Uh, we'll start things out in the Canada West. Um, some pretty interesting results from uh, the past weekend. Calgary, they're coming in at number three in our top ten. Do you agree? 
and why? Uh, it's a lot different team this year, and I think it's a little premature to label them as a number three team in the country. Mer Mercer Timmis is a quality running back, however, and I think he's a pretty uh, capable guy to replace Stephen Lombella. Uh, absolutely. He's going to get better and better. Last year, I think he had a five-touchdown game. He's, uh, he's going to step in very nicely for them. They're uh, just kind of struggling without the identity that they had last year. I think losing 10 guys on defense is always difficult to go through, but they're 1-0. They picked up a win. Uh, that's they're only going to get better so we'll see but I think three is a little bit high right now uh, with Kyle Quinlan out of the mix who's going to step in to that role the heir apparent to the one and only Kyle Quinlan uh, we have Austin Kennedy we've got JDR Jeremy Doyon Rock Cayman Shutter new kid on the block in Regina Will Finch and of course Drew Burko in Saskatchewan I think it's going to be Drew Burke or Will Finch. Uh, both big, athletic guys have strong arms. They uh, they're young. They you can still tell they have a lot of inexperience. Uh, Drew kind of struggles with a little bit of inconsistency from time to time. The other day, first half. Uh, came out two touchdowns, no picks, was really good. Got a little shaky in the third quarter, and unfortunately for them, Regina came back a little bit. So uh, Will Finch is probably one of the more technically sound quarterbacks that I've seen at such a young age, so he's going to only get better on that. Western's a great program, and uh, I think those two are going to be the next kind of two guys who really take the CIS uh, by storm. I think if you're looking at this year right away for numbers, uh, I think Jeremy Doyon Rock is your man. I think maybe over the long term, those two second-year quarterbacks that you talked about in Burko and Finch are going to be the guys that will be uh, top billing guys. But right now, I think Rock is the guy. I think Austin Kennedy is kind of on his heels, but Austin Kennedy has this thing where he starts well against weaklings in the OUA and then his numbers slowly taper off. Uh, I think uh, in terms of a complete game, Jeremy Doyon Rock can bring it. He doesn't have the greatest protection up front. Uh, and as we saw against Bishops, his supporting cast sometimes can let him down. Uh, now, what will it take to beat Laval? Our final question on the board here, definitely the biggest one in the CIS this season. These guys are, they just look unreal, season in and season out. What will it take to knock off, uh, knock off the top dog? I think it's going to take a perfect game from somebody, uh, Montreal. Uh, they they showed last year that they can play with them. Uh, a little bit of uh, disciplinary actions for them when they're playing them. A bunch of penalties. Uh, if they play a perfect game, I think that they can hang around with Laval. Uh, Laval gets outside the conference, and as you know, anything can happen uh, there. So it's going to be one of those times where they're top dog, and they're you're going in there, and you're not really expected to win. So it's going to be a big underdog story if they're able to win, but it's going to take a perfect game. I was really impressed with what I saw out of Montreal this weekend against Concordia. They are tough in the trenches on both sides. Uh, obviously, they have a challenge at quarterback, but Rotran Sene on a snowy track, even if it is in Laval, I think has a chance to win a football game. And I think Danny Machocha, the coach in Montreal, has uh, realized that they've got to do this through muscle and they've got to do it through strength. Machocha, when he first came in there, really tried to open up the passing game and that didn't work. Uh, I think you've got to go pound for pound with Laval and especially with some of the changes in their defense, they may be able to take advantage of that if, like you say, Bill, they play the perfect game. Uh, I think if they get out of their conference, they're going to run roughshod. But the other thing that works against Laval is the calendar because they only win in even years outside of 2003, and this is an odd number of years. So maybe just based on the calendar alone, Laval might be uh, behind the eight ball. You remember in 2009, they were supposed to cruise through to uh, the Vanier Cup, which w they were hosting, and who was there in, in the Vanier Cup in 2009? Queens and Calgary. Queens with their Union Jack flags and their Balmorals on their head in Quebec City, winning a Vanier Cup. I'm sure that went down like a lead balloon. Well, you need to have a good quarterback, you need to have a good defense, and a hell of a horoscope to win that Vanier Cup. Right. I mean, that's what it comes down the stars to. stars have to align. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Let's uh, check out the CIS Top 10. Number 10, Bishop's Gators, after a one-point upset of crosstown rival Sherbrooke. Nine, the Manitoba Bisons, big number, 65 points, 10,199 in the barn. Eight, Saskatchewan Huskies, who held on versus provincial rival Regina. Seven, Wealth Griffins, Ferraro's toe keeps them 2-0. and oh. Six, the McMaster Marauders, 1-1, one one, getting crowned at Queens. Five, Calgary Dinos, UBC gives them a scare. 
four, Western Mustangs, purple, left brush, Ravens, black and blue. Three, Montreal Caravan, Trench Warfare on the mount. Two, Queens Gales, Max Street rests at Richardson. And number one, the Laval Rouge Or. Be afraid, be very afraid. If you're watching this show on Saturday, at halftime, it's Friday Night Highlights. Crown Countdown U has Countdown.